Hi, this is Miss Lynn, and it's lunchtime on Friday before the AP exam. Say hi. Hi. All right, so we have, oops, we, okay, no. We have done big idea one, two, three, and we're currently on big idea four. And we are on big idea four B. Um, let me go back. So remember, this one's all about systems and interactions within systems. And then big idea 4B is going to talk about competition and cooperation are important aspects of biological systems. So anything to do with co competition and cooperation, that's this big idea. Several of these we've already talked about, right? We've talked about changes in free energy and energy that is a, uh, energy that's available to do work. This is a system, right? So exergonic reactions release energy, endergonic reactions we put energy in. We already went over that, yes? Mm -hmm. Feel good about that? Okay, we know what enzymes do. What do enzymes do? Lower the oxidation. Good job. Okay, um, when we talk about an endergonic versus, versus an exergonic reaction, the endergonic reaction we have to put energy in, exergonic reaction releases. Which type of reaction tends to be spontaneous? Exergonic. Even exergonics, though, have a hurdle that they have to go. What do we call that? Energy of activation. And that's what the enzymes lower. Good. So what do you call that special place on the enzyme where it does all its business? Active site. Okay. And why are enzymes so specific in who they react with? Because of the shape of the active site, right? It's so that's why enzymes work at a particular temperature and pH. Good. All right. So um, different things can um, vary how well that, that enzyme works, like um, substrate concentration. Obviously, as your substrate levels go up, then you're going to have increased enzyme functionality. But then it starts to level off. Why does it level off? Oh, because it's too full. Like What's too full? The enzyme is high. The, all, all of the active sites are occupied. If all the active sites are occupied, it cannot go any faster. It's going at its maximum potential. All right. Um, another way we talked about competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibition, whatever is doing the competing is binding to the actual active, active site, competing for that spot. Non-competitive inhibition. It binds to the uh, secondary site. Secondary site, good. And which changes the shape of the active site, which ultimately changes the active site. Now, whatever this may be, it's not like it's a bad thing, like, oh my gosh, my enzyme shut down. It's not necessarily, you only want an enzyme on when you need it, right? So if you have enough product, so um, then you can have a feedback of the product, and that can actually be a non-competitive inhibitor, which then will shut the enzyme down. Um, oh, here we go, end product inhibition. All right, so these are all things that could affect enzyme regulation. Do you see how you could have an essay just on that? And you would have to identify, let's say, three different factors that can affect enzyme function. Right, that would be a really good question. All right, um, next, I'm going fast too. Um, sociobiology, this is also a system, right? How organisms interact with each other. We talked about the advantages of living together, more eyes, more to defend against predators, maybe you can share jobs. Um, and we talked about within societies, it looks like some are self-sacrificing. And if you actually sacrifice your fitness for the fitness of, of another, then what would that be called? But does it actually exist? No. Probably not. There's probably some benefit for your fitness. It may not be direct. It could be indirect, like what? What would be an example of indirect fitness? Your relative, yes. Or it could be I'll scratch your back if you reciprocal scratch mine. Altruism. Yeah, reciprocal altruism. What you don't see in reciprocal altruism is I'll die for you today if you die for me <laughs> tomorrow, okay? Because that, that's not going to work. But if, you, if I die for you today and you die tomorrow for somebody within my line, right, then that could make sense, right? Okay. Um, so those are all examples of that. Here, they're not fighting to mate with a female. Why? Why do they just watch and not interfere? What could be a reason? Oh, because they're related and they'd still be passed on. Yeah, they're related, so it's all good. Okay, the genes are getting passed on. Um, we looked at reciprocal altruism with bats. We already know that one. Um, more things. Um, we talked about the system, uh, or sorry,
sorry, the synapse and how one neuron can trigger another neuron. We have already gone over that. I am happy to go over it again. Would you like me to go over it again? One more time, are you good? We went over it twice good. already. Yeah, well, twice already, okay, good. More resource partitioning. Partitioning, this can decrease what? Competition. Just fighting one location, we've already gone over that. Ecological succession, change over time. Um, I wanted to show you an, a contrary example between periodic fires versus rare fires, okay? And let me do the rare fires. When the fires aren't happening that often, okay, then the understory right here gets taller and taller and taller. So when that fire does come through, because the understory is so high, it's easy then from the fire to jump from the understory to the top of the forest canopy and end up ultimately destroying that forest completely by taking out all the trees because the, the treetops get taken out. But when you have periodic fires, how do you see how this is different and why would it be advantageous? Tell somebody next to you. Does that make sense to you? So that's why fires, where somebody would be like, oh my gosh, put the fire out, you would say, let it burn. Because periodic fires are healthy for the overall ecosystem. I wanted, just in case you had to write an essay or something like that, you would have something up in your wheelhouse for that. Okay, um, deforestation, reforestation, let, yeah, let's do that. Okay, um, we know deforestation, half of all species live in tropical rainforest communities and we end up wiping them out. Back. Back. Um, look at this chart. Whoever explained last time, have the other person explain this chart this time. You should be able to do this no problem. Depending on the number of trees What is a pattern you could say here? What are, let's identify some patterns. The drier it is, what? The colder. Well, not necessarily the colder. The, more it is, the, more it the less veg vegetation, right? The drier, because plants apparently need water. Okay. <laughs> I know, big ticket item there. Okay, um, this area right here where it's hot, where it's wet at the equator, right? That's where you have the greatest amount of species biodiversity. We looked at that, okay? Then you go to the other extreme, you have less. All right. Um, yay. 4C, we're getting so close. Interactions within biological systems lead to complex properties. So this is saying the way things work in systems can lead to complexity, right? Um, so let's look at some examples of this. So our environment interacts with us at the cellular level, and the cell then responds to their environment. Um, this is a good chart. Okay, look in the top left-hand corner. Selection generally acts um, from the environment down to the genes. So the environment can only influence the what? Phenotype. phenotype. The phenotype is there because of the genotype. genotype. So ultimately, the environment can impact the genotype, the genotype right? Through the phenotype. Now, conversely, a genotype can then code for a phenotype. That phenotype, whatever it's doing, we're coding, we're animals. Are we doing things to the environment? Are we changing the environment? Yes, okay? So it can work both ways. Um, next, mechanisms of evolution. Let's just kind of scan through that chart. Oh, we did the first one. Yes, we did. Everybody's cool with it? Yeah. Okay. Um, we know, what is this showing you? Okay, it is based on gender, but it's what? And what kind of trait is this? Polygenic. Yeah, multiple genes coding. It's not like there's big and tall. I mean, sorry. <laughs> big and tall. And it's not like there's tall and short, right? There's a lot of variations in between. So that's probably polygenic. You can see situations like that. Okay? Um, we want to have genetic diversity. Continue. Because um, we want to maintain biodiversity. And when you have changes on an ecosystem, it usually bounces back the more complexity that you have. Um, okay, we already talked about ep epistasis. Do you remember that? We have. Re want me to do it? No, you good? Okay. No. You say no. You say no. Okay. So let's just 
It's very brief, yeah. okay? The F is static, it doesn't matter. You could be brown or I could be black. Okay, let's say black is dominant over brown, okay? I'm neither one of those colors unless the epistatic gene says lay down some pigment. It has to say lay down pigment. Then, then the other genes will tell you what color that pigment will be, okay? Um, we looked at temperatures infecting, uh, affecting the sex of reptiles. We already looked at, I remember looking yeah. at this, keystone predator, okay? We looked at alien species. Exotic exotic species and they usually there's some sort of there are natural barriers in place right um, pythons came from Southeast Asia or something like that right and so no, there's normally a large body of water to separate them but um, some of this was released out into the environment in Florida and then the in Florida those species did not evolve with the pythons so there were not natural predators there and that's why it's decimating the native um, organisms. Okay, so those were all the causes of broken barriers. Colonization, horticulture and agriculture, and accidental transport. And remember, when we talked about what decreases biodiversity, well, extinction. Remember we talked about what factors are involved in extinction? What was number one? Habitat, Habitat, Habitat loss. What was number two? Exotic, Exotic species. species. Number three? Pollution. Pollution. No, what? No, no, no. Pollution. Number four, over-exploitation, and number five was disease. Okay, um, so that's, that's pretty. So not all animals are gonna respond in the same way, but if you have this delicate ecosystem, one may be more impacted by that than another. One may be more sensitive to a few degrees change in climate change than another. But if you end up wiping out that species, we looked at examples of that where it ends up throwing off a whole ecosystem, right? Um, the prairie chickens are extremely rare. Their habitat, they're losing, and due to hunting, they're getting fewer and fewer. And they do a lot of inbreeding. So they don't have a lot of bio, they don't have diversity in their genes. Um, they are endangered, but they have enough that it keeps them going and keeps them alive, right? And then we can talk about um, how much space they need in order to maintain um, their population. So here are two different woods. One has greater biodiversity than the other. You can see that, right? And if you wipe out just that one tree in Woodland A, who has less biodiversity, and you wipe out that one tree in Woodland B, who's it gonna have a greater impact on? Woodland A. a. Yeah, Woodland A, because it's most of it. And that's what I'm talking to you about, monocultures, where we only grow one kind of weed. If we wipe it all out, it has a huge impact, right? So that's why we want to have more diverse species. And if you remember, there were three direct reasons why you would want to have um, biodiversity. One was medicinal. Another one was agriculture and, and consumption. consumption. Yeah, to maintain biodiversity. Okay, um, growth models. What are the two growth models? We reviewed this, right? Exponential, Exponential and logistic, right? All right. Okay. Is he reaching a carrying capacity? No. No. His environment's probably going to fluctuate before he ever reaches that carrying capacity. Here, yeah, crash and burn, exactly. Okay, carrying capacity, we already talked about that. Um, yes, yes. Um, and then it was just these, these problems, right? You feel comfortable with that? Yeah. What is R? No, that is not R. Birth rate minus death rate. Yeah, okay, good. All right. And then do you remember survivorship curves? Which one are us? Yeah, type one. So most of our thousand, I know, that was fun. English good. Um, most of our thousand, if you look at it, will survive until the end of our lifespan, right? We're type one. The opposite of that is type three, most die. Okay, um, competition, is that a density dependent factor, factor or a density independent factor? Density dependent. Right, does it normally moderate a J or a K? K. Okay, good. All right, then there are just random things that can affect or behavioral things like due to crowding, et cetera, that can change the population. We talked about our selected species small, fast, reproducing, not giving a lot of care to their offspring versus case-selected species, okay? Um, now, um, environment, 
okay? So um, if there's something that gets into your environment, we have immune response, we looked at plant responses, right, to immunity. Some of them will just, some of they'll make a barrier of dead cells just so something can't get in, right? Um, we talked about um, the um, innate response, right, that everybody has. What is the most common? Neutrophils, right? And they are not specific, they just know foreign from domestic, yes, and then just try to kill anything that's foreign. And your um, specific immune response, what are the two categories? B and T. Yeah, B and T, but what is it called? Antibody mediated and cell mediated. Antibody mediated and cell. Cell is the T cells, right? Cell to cell combat. Antibodies are the B cells, good. Um, we talked about the inflammatory response. Um, already, we're good on that, yeah? I remember specific, do you want me to go over it? Okay, so we're talking about the complexity. Um, when you look at these two systems, the pH level and the receptors in our carotid artery are gonna detect if, this, if the pH level is low. Why would the pH level be low? Yeah, so carbon dioxide binds with water and forms carbonic acid, which breaks down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions, which lowers your pH, okay? So then the chemoreceptors in, the, in, your, in your artery can detect that, detect that, and then that can send a signal then to your brain like, oh, we better speed up our heart rate. We better breathe more because we must need more oxygen because we're producing all this carbon dioxide. There's some complexity in that, right? amazing that it knows to make your heart beat faster and it knows to make your breathe deeper just because of the pH of your blood, right? Okay, um, no. <laughs> um, cilia working together to bring things up, um, helping to clean out your body. We can look at a system like the countercurrent flow. We saw countercurrent flow multiple times, right? So they're working in opposite directions with fish lamellae in order to get maximum oxygen out of the water. Where else would we see it? The nose of a camel. Nose of a camel, where else? What? In the nephrons, exactly. Okay, um, there's your nephron. Um, we looked at TATC theory, right? Let's name the things. Transpiration, Transpiration which is the evaporation of water out open stomata. A, adhesion, adhesion. what's that? So polar surfaces like the xylem wall, and then the next one, and that's based on the water potential gradient, and the water potential would be highest in the roots, right? Lowest in the leaves and outside in the air, and so water is getting drawn due to the water potential gradient. T A T C C stands for one water molecule with another water molecule. Okay, good. Um, we did this, right? What happens when you compete? You either die or you do what? Recharge position. Right. In time or in space. Okay. Water and mineral uptake. We talked about this. Actively transport in minerals, making a hypertonic environment so water will. Follow it. And we talked about the proton pump in order to do that, right? So if we can, we can harvest that multiple times, that proton, by making that gradient, we can use it, you know, to make many things functions in one, stomata opening and closing, right? In roots, and then go study. That's it. Oh. No, <laughs> you actually did it. Um, but you do need to review, I give you math reviews and answer keys, right? You do need to review your labs. I would read the labs, you know, I would look through them. Um, there are science practices that we went over. Um, Bozeman has great videos, like where it looks at the whole year and it looks at the big ideas, it looks at the science practices and has you interpret data, okay? Keep in mind, these are your four big ideas, right? Evolution drives diversity and unity. Biological systems utilize it. It's all about energy, then it's about information, and then it's about interactions, okay? Don't forget about your science practices, okay? These are things that can show up in both essays and in questions. And then I wanna remind you again about these 55, right? Essential understandings or essential knowledge, and these enduring understandings we went through, but then 
I gave you that chart. If you forget, I gave you that chart. It's in your reviews. You're not going to be interested in the assignment, but once you get here, it talks about all the big ideas and the essential knowledge. There's 55 Bozeman's to go along with these 55. And then there's the learning objectives, right? So let's not forget about that as well. Okay, if you look here, the four big ideas, enduring understandings, which are here, essential knowledge here, plus these science practices here, do the learning objectives. And you have a list of every learning objective as well. Good job. I'll see you Monday morning. I'm proud of you. Have a piece of toast, all four big ideas.